Welcome to the Truckers Network Radio Show on TNCRadio.live, where we offer the news, weather, traffic, sports, information, and entertainment our commercial drivers want to hear. I'm your host, Shelley Johnson. Speaking of entertainment, compelling documentaries that portray the true fabric of America are very entertaining. Robert Ramos and Pedro Gomez set out on a journey to capture the essence of Miami along the ocean side long after the Jackie Gleason years. Their documentary, South Beach Shark Club, tells a compelling story of life in the 1960s and 1970s and the character of the community at the time. It explores the rugged life of René de Dios, an iconic figure and idol of many boys who wanted to learn the art of shark fishing. It's about real-life fishermen and the children they mentored who lived along South Beach before the high-rises that dot the landscape today. It's an homage to a bygone era that shaped many a boy into the man he would become. It's also a story of man against beast and the inspiration of youth who find an extended family and a skill to prove their mettle along the ocean side. I can tell you back in the days, if you want to hear another story, because guess what? I'm a storyteller. And do you know throughout history, there's been storytellers? And I feel like I'm one of them. I'm one of the storytellers. So I can tell you a great story about the South Beach Shark Club. Miami Beach, specifically South Beach, I would compare it to, uh, what could I compare it to? In the old days, it was uh, totally different. It was uncrowded, it was relaxed, it was laid back. Could actually be a surf bump and make a living with a cast net netting mullet. Two out of every three people on South Beach have no car, no access to one. Half the people here live on less than $150 per month. South Beach is in decline. It was a lot of the old people that came to retire in South Beach. Just feeding the birds or just waiting to die, basically. It was a retirement home. The southern tip of Miami Beach has a high concentration of elderly residents, perhaps higher than any other area of comparable size in the world. Fifth Street was called Miami Beach Boulevard. South of Fifth Street was a community in itself. You know, imagine you have this retirement community of these zillions of elderly old people and then this little bunch of younger people. So we all knew each other. There are only 50 low-rent housing units in Miami Beach, all clustered at the very tip of South Beach. If you live south of Fifth, it was basically like very decrepit. Our parents were very poor. We lived in small apartments. You know, no air conditioning, you know, jealousy windows. For the most part, Miami Beach from 6th Street South is not a pretty place. It's very old, one of the oldest neighborhoods in South Florida. It was a dump site is what it was. It was a rough scene. It wasn't like it is now. Have you been to South Beach lately? Probably not. Most of us try to avoid the old rundown area of Miami Beach, south of 6th Street. The city of Miami Beach has declared it a blighted area and resulted for renewal. South Beach, a ghetto in the sun, a place where old people and old values are making a lonely final struggle. There's a lot that's truly depressing sites many of us would like to eliminate. But there are others too, young people who feel at home on one of the few pieces of real beach left in Miami Beach. And new ethnic groups, Cubans and Blacks, families, bringing young children back to these weary streets. I have Robert Ramos, the director of Shark Beach Shark Club, with me today to talk about the history and what inspired this really cool documentary. Robert, from what I understand, Many Floridians are familiar with what went on in South Beach and Miami and the shark fishing over the years, but it may not have been common knowledge nationwide. It certainly changed a lot in character over the years. Now we've got the beachfront high rises out there. And of course, no longer in Florida, do you have the unobstructed views people used to have driving down A1A. What was it like before all the commercialization? 
in South Beach. Yeah, I mean, at that in that era in the 1970s, it was a very sleepy beach town, uh, nothing like what it is today. And, you know, we were kind of past the uh, heyday of the Rat Pack and the Jackie Gleason era. And Miami Beach had kind of become this unattractive place. Uh, the way tur tourism was heading, uh, you know, a lot more people were heading to Orlando, like Disney World. I mean, the Bahamas, mm -hmm. you know, things had become, uh, you know, just more popular than Miami Beach. Miami Beach is kind of in a slump. So they actually converted a lot of the old apartments on South Beach into uh, studio apartments. And a lot of people went down there to retire. So you had this uh, vibrant Jewish population. You had like the first wave of Cuban migrants coming in. And um, it was just like a sleepy beach town, you know, and you have these kids uh, specifically that we're focusing on in the documentary that were kind of just like living this beach bum lifestyle, you know, surfing, skating, fishing, kind of without a care in the world. Um, very much different from, you know, the modern Miami Beach that you see today. That it's, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that's, uh, you know, like Ocean Drive is like, you know, just a huge party destination. It's like the Bourbon Street of, of Miami. And uh, as opposed to back in the day where you just had this sleepy little beach town. A sleepy little beach town sounds so much more appealing. And it sounds like a better place for kids to grow up. Because with the shark fishing that your documentary is about, that gave a lot of the boys something to do. And you feature a number of the men who taught the boys how to fish. They were mentors, and it kept the kids out of trouble. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, you have these uh, these young Cuban migrants who came to Miami in that era, and, you know, with kind of uh, no direction and, you know, uh, poor families, you know, lower class families that uh, were given kind of, a, you know, a purpose from learning a skill and learning this discipline and, you know, just became completely enchanted with uh, living life uh, on the beach and in the water. Yeah. Um, this marine oriented life, you know, whether it was surfing or, or fishing or diving, uh, you know, they were kind of all connected through this little community there. So, yeah, um, it's really important message in the film as well, like just how uh, learning a skill and having a discipline like that and feeling like you're part of something uh, can be so much bigger and, and help people get out of sometimes bad situations, which you do see materialize later, uh, especially in the third act of the documentary with Shannon, who is like, you know, quite literally going down the wrong road. Uh, he becomes part of a gang. And he's hanging out with the wrong people in the early 90s in, in Miami Beach. And mm -hmm. basically fishing saves his life. Well, certainly the mentors these kids had, they had somebody to look up to. And it really did inspire them. It made them so much better. Let's listen to a soundbite from your documentary that talks about that. Some of the kids I'm very proud of that they become excellent shark fishermen. I'm not going to say that I taught them because there's something in here. They are better than the teachers. And it's all because of what's in here. It has nothing to do with what I taught them. I think any kid that's exposed to the water carries that in his blood for life. It's something that sticks with you. It doesn't leave you. It's part of uh, who you become when you're exposed to that young. Yeah, I'm so thankful that I moved towards the ocean. It's the, the best thing I think anyone can do for kids. We felt we were all very privileged to be near the ocean. I mean, you can grow up in a city and you can grow up in an environment which is not very conducive to behavior, you know, which is not conducive to good character building, good personality building. But when you're in the, near the ocean, it's a very safe environment. The ocean was a magnet that drew many people to South Beach. My son, he dies to go fishing with me. He loves tagging along with me, like taking out baits the whole nine yards. The times are changing, and a lot of us have followed suit with conservation. Every shark I catch, I try my best to get the hooks out fast and release it now. It means so much that I really want him to be able to shark fish. I want my son to be able to kayak out shark baits and there'll be some sharks 
where I caught sharks on Miami Beach. When you ask me about fishing and the love of it, fishing is just not about killing fish. You have a passion about it that you want to share with others. In the beginning, uh, perhaps uh, somebody might point the finger and say, well, you guys were killing a bunch of sharks and that shouldn't have been done. Perhaps we were uh, not as knowledgeable in the beginning as we all were towards the end. We've changed completely. We turned around 100%. Every one of my sharks now are cut loose. I was probably one of the first guys years ago, 91, 92, and we would cut them off and let them go. People change, man. You mature, you 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 research, you learn, and you, know, you could be different than you were five years ago, 10 years ago. If I don't keep it alive, how special it was to me and, and how how beautiful it was the thing that we had that I was taught from by Renee Hammer and all these guys, then it's gonna die out. I'll never let it die. My son will pass it on to his kids. And to me, it's, it's, it's very dear in my heart, the, the circle of friends we had. I'll always keep those memories alive through photo and through stories, and my kid will pass it on too. That's so compelling. Robert, before I have you go into detail about what your documentary is about, I thought maybe we could cover shark fishing. Uh, what is that all about? I is that a good living eventually? Can people make that into a living? Um, there's a lot that goes into it. I mean, those are mammoth beasts to try to <laughs> reel in. Yeah. In, in that era, I mean, it was very different. Um, there weren't many regulations for shark fishing. It was kind of like uh, like snake hunting in a way as okay. – uh, it, it, and and I mean, there was a market for it. So actually, there are some sharks that are good table fare, and there's other sharks that that aren't as much. But they use them for crab traps, and they sell them to different markets and things like that. And uh, a lot of times, this was uh, how some of these guys made a living back then. Whereas opposed to now, I mean, everything is focused on conservation, and there's just not a need to kill a shark or anything like that. It's more of like preserving this subculture, and you know, working with. Um, these different organizations like FWC, Florida Fish and Wildlife, to protect the sharks. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, back then it was, you know, it, it just signified this machismo, bravado, yeah. um, you know, very much ego driven thing, you know, to to do battle with these beasts and oh, yeah. to, to, to kind of show off and show your dominance. And whereas there's a there's a character, Rene de Dios, in the movie who represents and embodies that and yes. he just becomes obs obsessed with with catching the biggest shark he can on rod and reel and just to prove it to himself and maybe to everyone else that um that he's you know that he's the best shark fisherman in the world because he actually believed that so sure. um, that kind of leads him on this wild ride you know to the bahamas throughout south florida and just Kind of putting other people in danger, putting himself in danger. I mean, the guy becomes so obsessed, he loses his wife and he loses his job and he's still just single-mindedly obsessed with catching the biggest shark he can. So there's definitely this, I think this, this strange mythical type thing about doing battle with a beast that, you know, in this case, he just became completely, uh, I mean, taken over by it. He was, he was a, totally obsessed. It was an addiction almost. <laughs> yeah, I would say yeah. so. Robert, before we get into more details about your documentary, we do have to go to break here. Got to pay the bills. You're listening to the Truckers Network radio show here on TNC Radio Live. Stay tuned for more coming up. TNC Radio Live is proud to carry the Steve Summers Overnight Drive Show. TNC Radio Live is dedicated to commercial drivers. We offer the news, traffic, and weather you need, and the entertainment, sports, talk, music, and celebrity interviews you want to hear 24 7. We have original shows and trucker podcasts that feature some of your favorites, like Ice Road Alex Demogorski and America's Truck and Sweetheart Marcia Campbell. TNC Radio Live is convenient and designed for professional drivers. 
The best part is we're free and you can listen anywhere you are on the road. With just one tap, you can tune into Steve Summers and us right on your phone. Simply download our app by going to app.tncradio.live. That's app.tncradio.live. Did you know that 80% of America's communities rely on trucking alone to deliver their goods? The trucking industry keeps America running thanks to the 3.6 million professional truck drivers traveling over 300 billion miles a year. Industry movement Trucking Moves America Forward, or TMAF, tells the story of trucking and its positive impact on our economy, communities, and lives. Learn how you can be part of the industry movement working to build a strong image of trucking by visiting truckingmovesamerica.com. Welcome back to the Truckers Network Radio Show here on TNC Radio Live. I'm your host, Shelley Johnson. I'm speaking with Robert Ramos. He's the director of South Beach Shark Club. We're learning what inspired the documentary, what the documentary is all about, and the rugged life of shark fishing, and what South Miami was like years ago. You know, what I found amazing in watching the documentary, the upper body strength and endurance the shark fishermen had to have to tackle these beasts and reel them in. Just amazing. Yeah, definitely. And and Rene wasn't a big guy. No. Um, uh-uh. he, was, he was actually a smaller guy. But, um, yeah, there's a lot of little techniques they use that, you know, I became privy to by hanging out with them over the years and, you know, filming them. But they use, like, leverage um, on that rod to... Uh, to move the fish around, also the current. So there's all these little tricks and all these little tactics they use as well that would help them bring in bring in these giant fish sometimes, you know, as big as 14 feet. Now, did you actually grow up in that area? Is that where you became really intrigued with all of this? Yeah, I grew up in Miami Beach, so I'm in a really unique position to tell this story. Mm-hmm. Um, this almost plays like an homage to my father and my uncle's they used to tell me stories like if they were, you know, fairy tales or if they were just like, you know, this, these legends. And I just became fascinated with it. So I was exposed to it as a child. I grew up boating and fishing, but my mom like tried to keep me away from these guys because they were a little rugged and <laughs> a little bit crazy. So I, I sometimes, sometimes uh, I remember one time my, you know, my uncle kind of like, uh, snuck me away from the house and I was in a tent with them. You know, they're like on the beach drinking beer, like putting out shark lines. And I mean, I was just like fascinated by it. But yeah, my dad had to come and pick me up real quick and get me out of there. Um, <laughs> <I bet. laughs> well, you're a boat captain. So you you did still uh, have it in your blood. And, and of course, you're a musician. And obviously you produce short and feature length films. So you've really diversified. But I think <laughs> it's really neat that you have an homage to that whole era and your family too your second generation cuban american and was this something that your your family members decided to do for a living when they came over here um it was more like just kind of like the neighborhood thing to do i mean Mm -hmm. uh which is like a weird neighborhood thing to do that you may only find in somewhere as strange as miami beach um (laughs) like but that's that's what it was. There's a little bait shop on 14th Street and uh, my father, and my uncle uh, live right next to that. And so they just became exposed to this world. And I guess, uh, you know, this is the kind of stuff that that happens in, in, you know, in California, you have better downhill for skateboarding and better surf. So there were better surfers and better skateboarders there. And over here you had you know, less of that and, and better fishing. So a lot of people got funneled into that skill and into that world that is just so unique and, and bizarre. <laughs> well, when you think about it, it it really, for an adolescent, especially trying to find his masculinity, taking on a beast like a shark would really be something that would be addictive. It's like, I am going to win. Uh, the competition between you and that shark, it'd be a rite of passage of sorts. Yeah, for sure. I think that's, you know, that's kind of what that represents. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, a lot of times these guys, like, um, that that's that's how they, that's how they prove themselves. And that's why, I mean, you know, it's called South Beach Shark Club. And, it's, sure. you know, it did, it was actually a club. It was actually a club at one point. But before that, it was just like, you know, a group of people hanging out. So, 
the way to, you know, to get in with, you know, with the in crowd was to, you know, put yourself out there and, and become involved with what they were doing. It just so happens what they were doing was paddling out giant bloody baits on surfboards, you know, 200 <laughs> yards out into the ocean uh -huh. and uh, dropping them out there and waiting for giant sharks to come and, and eat their bait. So you have all these kids who are, you know, just trying to be involved with like, you know, the group and part of like, you know, uh, the, the little the, the little group of guys over there uh, hanging out on the pier and and they're just putting their lives at risk you know, oh, basically yeah. uh, for that so I mean in a way I guess you know it, it was really important it was it was really important for them whether or not they really knew what they were doing you know well, at the time they were doing it if somebody was an adrenaline junkie I guess this would be the ultimate thrill if you survive right <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean it, I think there's other ways too but yeah I would say so mm-hmm now, your documentary features a number of the shark fishermen and essentially how they mentored so many boys. Did you want to kind of go into the details of what your documentary covers? Yeah, I mean, um, specifically one of our characters, Shannon Bustamante, mm -hmm. he grows up in Miami Beach and and he kind of represents uh, this, you know, the someone who's going down the wrong path and someone who you know, unfortunately, um, has this tragedy that both his parents die when he's really young. And so he gets involved with the wrong people, like a lot of people that this that may happen to, uh, he, he becomes part of like a gang. And um, yeah, I mean, it just gets really kind of dark. I don't want to give everything away exactly. Right. But um, yeah, he does. It gets kind of dark. And so, you know, fishing through fishing, he finds another alternative, you know, another, you could say it's almost like a gang. But in this gang, they're they're <laughs> rather than uh you know sell, selling drugs and becoming uh you know there's there's a, a a bank that's robbed by the gang that he's affiliated with there are you know there's murders there's all this like really dark and messed up stuff going on and you know as an alternative you know he finds this peace in going to the keys with his like these surrogate fathers that are you know teaching him this skill and. And it just completely changes his life. Now he's like a family man. He's got kids. And so, you know, in this in this case, this uh, this actually saved his life the way he puts it. Well, Shannon went through a lot, as he explains here in your documentary. I would have anxiety as a kid just worrying about my dad getting into it with these guys. And the whole time there, I'm just like friends are like, oh, my God. They're gonna kill my dad. They're gonna burn our house. They're gonna come back and shoot our house. My first encounter that little was I was scared. <laughs> In different ages, it meant different things to me. When I'm seven, eight years old, it's like big fear. Gunfire shatters the quiet of yet another South Florida neighborhood. Welcome to South Florida's teenage war zone. It's not a place for tourists. Here are kids who came out of families who went into a substitute family that is so strict and is so harsh and does not tolerate very much, which tells you something, that kids want a sense of direction. They need nurturing. They need to belong to something. I actually didn't fully escape from that lifestyle. Um, my mom died when I was 14, and then uh, I did. I fell into it because then my best friends were coincidentally some of the worst ones for our age that just really sucked me in real quick. And then three years later, I'm 17 and my dad dies. So for, for a good uh, portion of my life, my childhood, I was, I was entrenched in all of it. And some really, uh, really gnarly stuff, some stuff I'm, I'm even uh, 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 ashamed to talk about, some crazy, some crazy things I've done and seen. There was two things, there was a bank robbery Two armed men in ski masks robbed the Republic National Bank. And then there was a shooting on 71st Street where they, they shot some kid. I think they killed him. And from there, they were like, South Florida's most wanted. Everywhere we went, everywhere we went to play football or go fishing, there's people taking pictures of everything. Pictures, 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 pictures. They shot pictures forever. You'd be jumping off the pier, pictures. <laughs> like we paparazzi, you know, these dudes are paparazzi. And in one, in one shot, just threw a net and netted. Even if you were just hanging out, you know, luckily I was too young. When that happened, when the indictment happened, they got him on a huge racketeering, like what they do for the mafia. Front page articles, the 86 gang members arrested. Southeast Posse, Rico Act, racketeering. 
hemmed up everybody. They put a net around everybody. We're taking pictures for, for years. I just saw there was just shit at the end of this road. It was gonna end bad. It was gonna end bad. I was already doing things out of my character. I was already ashamed of things I was doing to people. You know, like I told you, my mom raised me with a lot of love. So I, when I saw it all crumbling, you know, uh, my best friend got deported. My other best friend got murdered. All my friends are in jail. All my other friends are smoking crack, you know, 18 years old, hooked on crack. You know, I'm like, this is, this is not, this is gonna end bad. I need to get out of this shit. These were common messages in your documentary. That's what I heard with a lot of the people who were interviewed on how this really gave them a direction. And I think in many cases, that's what kids need, especially if they maybe don't have a father figure. These men were very instrumental in giving them a focus and a direction. And it's really sad now that it's all commercialized. This isn't out there now. Yeah, I mean, this it's it's so important to have a community, especially um, when you're when you know people find themselves in these kinds of situations. So, you know, taking neighborhood kids off the street and and putting a fishing rod in their hands, if, yeah. if you know that just just it's just it's there are organizations that do things like that, like take a kid fishing. Mm -hmm. This. Uh, and uh, that, that's what that's a nonprofit that runs down here in South Florida to kid fishing. But um, yeah, Shannon, uh, Shannon still to this day goes actually, you know, through the neighborhood and through his old friends and uh, brings all these kids out to the pier and to the to the bridges and, you know, teaches them and takes them along and buys them lunch and, you know, shows them uh, what he was learning as a child as well. He's paying it forward. That's profound. We have to go to break here on TNC Radio dot live. You're listening to the Truckers Network Radio Show. Stay tuned for more coming up. The trucking industry keeps America running thanks to the 3.36 million professional truck drivers who deliver everyday goods to 80% of American communities who rely on trucking for that last mile. The industry represents a diverse group with nearly half of drivers at 42% as minorities. Trucking Moves America Forward, or TMAF, educates the public on the essentiality of trucking by telling the story of trucking and its positive impact on our economy, communities, and lives. Learn how you can join the industry movement by visiting truckingmovesamerica.com. Welcome back to the Truckers Network Radio Show on TNC Radio Live. I'm your host, Shelley Johnson. I'm talking with Robert Ramos. He's the director of the South Beach Shark Club documentary. Very compelling. We've been listening to a number of the sound bites. And Robert's been talking about what the documentary is all about and what life was like in Miami. The pier was really a big central place where people would gather. And then, of course, it was torn down and the, the beaches redone. You really get this feel of loss when this is done by the city of Miami. If you could tell us a little bit about the pier and, and what used to go on there. Yeah, I mean, the pier really was something that I was always attracted to because when I was growing up in Miami Beach, there was a pier there, but it's not the, it just wasn't the same. Um, the pier was on the beach side. So it's kind of like a specific thing as a fisherman, like they built the pier now inside of the cut where all the boat traffic goes through. So it's very difficult to fish there with the current and the boat traffic and a number of other things. So this pier was just built in a perfect place for for a fisherman and for a surfer too, because it created a wave break there. So mm -hmm. because you have this pier that is, you know, basically going out like so far into the ocean where there's like actual reef and there's current and then you have this wave break there, it created this community of, you know, surfers and divers and fishermen that all revolved around the pier. And it was a public space. It was a safe space that you could drop your kids off and they can go about their day and and tire themselves out in the ocean you know it just seemed like a beautiful place to grow up and so i kind of romanticized that and yeah in in the film itself it's like you know the pier is almost like a character and mm -hmm. it's a, a character that's you know that's housing and and teaching all these these uh, young as they call themselves pier rats <laughs> um, <laughs> you know about about some some aspect of of life and like, you know, beginning to, to shape them uh, in the ways we were just talking about. So 
Yeah, and then you know, all of a sudden that we that character dies, like you know, because the city does knock it down by the time in the early '80s. Uh, once the Muriel boat lift had happened, um, the pier was just it was pretty much um, not it wasn't being maintained well by the city, and then there was a lot of char- like sketchy characters kind of hanging out around there and around all of Miami Beach, and you know, they decided, hey, uh, we don't need this anymore, and they knocked it down and just expanded the beach basically, which was sad. So that was the motivation behind Miami. And then, of course, the evolution was uh, the commercialization and eventually the high rises and so forth came in, which totally changed the character of the whole community. I mean, we, we had the run of the beach. We thought that we actually owned that beach. We were there every day. We were there fishing. We were there doing whatever we want. You wanted to identify yourself with what was. So we identified ourselves as South Beach Pier Rats. You were proud to call yourself a rat, a <laughs> South Beach rat, really. The rats, they used to call it, oh, comes the rats. We were these little troublemakers. Pier rat is someone that lives on the pier, man. Your life revolves around the pier. I was a pier rat. We skateboarded, lived, slept, hung out, surfed. Everything was the pier. And then? the pier was gone. It was the end of an era, and it totally changed the fabric of that part of Miami. Correct. Well, you know, you just see that's that's part of the, you know, part of the film as well. It's like we wanted to show, like, how the city changed through the perspective of this one little subculture, and I think it's really interesting, you know, that, like, you know, what the pier represents. It represents, you know, public spaces that, you know, Sometimes you see disappearing or yeah. being sold to, you know, developers, especially down here in Miami and South Florida. I mean, it happens all the time. So, sure. you know, you kind of lose this special place uh, that you'll you'll never get back again that represents, you know, so much it represented for them, for these kids back then, you know, a sense of freedom and a uh, way to define themselves and to be, you know, connected to the ocean. Whereas now... Um, yeah, I mean, you just kind of have a lot of condos down there, and south of Fifth Street is not really for, uh, you know, your average person uh, who just, you know, may not have the money to to participate in all the uh, extravagance of Miami Beach and, you know, just wants to take a walk down the beach and surf or watch the surfers or just hang out and have a picnic or something or, you know, go fishing or whatever it may be. Which is sad. And that when you think about it, that was the original allure of Florida. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I think that era as well, too, in the 70s, I mean, you know, there's, it's just, it, it's, it's really, it's, it's just, uh, I mean, I, I've made, I made the film because, you know, I kind of was, it was a, a way for me to, to feel like, you know, I was to, to be a part of it in that time, because I wasn't alive yet. I grew up in the 90s in Miami Beach. So it was still very cool. And there was a lot of, there was a lot of, uh, it was different back then as well, like there weren't as much, uh, there wasn't so many big box stores and commercial stuff down there. And it felt like, you know, more local sense of community and things like that. But the seventies specifically just seemed like, just like such a cool, like compare it, compare it to, you know, Southern California in the seventies or like yeah. I, dog, dog town and Z boys is a similar movie to ours, except uh, it focuses on skateboarding. Primarily ours is, you know, goes into this very Florida fishing kind of thing, but it mm-hmm. just like that era is just fantastic. What are some of your favorite characters in your documentary? You feature a, a number of them, and they all have their own unique personalities. Yeah. Well, one of them is my uncle. Um, he's on his porch. Uh, he had a couple beers after he got out of work, and that was the first interview we ever <laughs> shot. I was like, oh, why don't we just start shooting? So before we even had a movie that was shot with uh, you know, just some intention that this could be used for uh, for the film. but you know, kind of on the fly. So it, it's very genuine and, and unique. And he's just kind of like given all these like crazy captain or crazy saltwater fishermen, <laughs> Ernest Hemingway character, drunk, drunken, uh, rambling. That's fantastic. Yeah. So he's yeah. one of them. I, I, you know, like then you just have all these, yeah, you have a, just a, a mix of this, this, uh, motley crew of you know like almost like you know piratey kind of south beach guys who mm-hmm. you know 
<laughs> uh, ranging from Hammer, who, you know, at the time of the filming, uh, he's like, I mean, he's he, he didn't have, he doesn't have any teeth, you know, he's sitting, he, he doesn't really care about that. Like, he just cares about being out on the bridge and fishing and being under the stars. And then you have, you know, Shannon, who's like all tatted up with like, you know, dreadlocks and, and just, it's just, it's so, it's so South Florida and it, it's so unique. It's like they're a bunch of modern pirates or something. Yeah. And I, and I just wanted to feature them all and make sure that their voices were, you know, genuine to who they are and, uh, and, and, you know, to the, to the shark club and, and to everything that, uh, that they went through. So, I mean, I, I, who was, re- who was your favorite character if you had one? Oh, I can't really say. I I think what I was impressed with was the mentorship for the kids Uh and the positive influence this all had. And it gave the boys a place to go when they maybe didn't have the family. And, And it gave them a sense of excitement and purpose. I mean, I thought it was interesting that as soon as they got us out of school, they had to go right to the beach. You know, that's what yeah. they lived for. And then, of course, the character that uh, was just, he was going to get the biggest shark no matter what. I mean, the obsession there, that was amazing. Yeah, I think, you know, what that's that's Rene de Dios. And Rene mm-hmm. actually had, um, it was, you know, we had to sift through so much archival footage to try to find these news clippings of Rene. And uh, he was actually like on the ESPN back in the day. We couldn't find it. Uh, and then he had like a, a series of interviews and specials that were done on ABC. And, you know, we found some of that stuff, but uh, yeah, he was just, he represents, you know, this obsession and someone who is driven off the rails by their obsession. And so he's like a modern, he's like a Captain Ahab on Miami he, Beach, yes, basically. Yes. 39 year old Rene de Dios of Miami Beach says he caught a 20 foot great white shark that dragged down their small boat. Meanwhile, the fish is taking me under now. Renee's side of the story was he was fighting the shark something like all day and all night, power wenching it. He was getting close, gaining on it, but that the boat was sinking. And the own captain of the boat, I guess, like to cut Renee's line, you're like signing your, your death papers. You know, this guy will probably stab you with a knife or something. As they're sinking, I think the captain with his own boat sinking never touched the line. And I remember, um, Renee being appreciative of that, he's like, he never cut my line, you know. When we were in the water, I got the line and I bit it with my teeth. So what, do you believe the story? Yeah, of course, I would believe everything that he said. Everything Renee said, I believe. Like, Renee was powerful with what he said. He, uh, sometimes he'd uh, cheat, you know, he'll cheat uh, to beat, win a tournament because of his competitiveness. But as far as the story, if he said it, it was probably the truth. So without any doubt in your mind, you know that was a great white shark. Oh, for sure. For sure. It was bigger than my boat. I think it was bigger than a 20-footer, you know? That thing was a beast. It looked like a submarine. I mean, I don't, I don't think nothing else goes that big. I mean, a tiger shark can go 12 feet long, 13 feet, you know? I don't think it can go, like, 20 feet long. Me and Renee look at each other like, Renee's like, you never know, Louis. This thing can be a 6,000-pound fish, 7,000-pound, you know, great white. If the world's record was in Cuba. They got him in Cuba, in Kohima. You know, the biggest shark caught was in Kohima. You know, they got him in Harpoon, but it was a 7,000-pound fish. Around 2 o'clock in the morning when he came up, and I saw that big shark come up next to me. This shark is bigger than my boat. They, they, they were hooking down. What, what are we going to do with this shark, Rene? We, 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 we're 50 miles away from land. We hook him, you know, uh, we're hooking this shark. What are we going to do? We're gonna, what are we going to do? We're going to tie him by his tail and drag him back? It's going to be impossible. Well, we just cut the shark and let it go, you know? Just let's let him go. And there was no way. He will die with a fishing rod in his hand there. And I said, Louis, this is my dream. And forget about it. I looked at my friend, you know what? He's right. That's his dream. And we're going to let him catch his dream. And we're going to do whatever it takes to Renee catch his shark. And that was it. That's what we went for. Flip the book. What happened? We are liable. The feeling of hooking a big shark is like the adrenaline starts going. You feel it. You're like, oh, I want to get him so bad. And then when you lose them, the highs become just as low. You know what I mean? You feel so bad that he got away. Back on dry land for the first time in a week, the three men still hang on to one of the fishing poles that first sank them and then saved them. 
39 year old Rene De Dios of Miami Beach says he caught a 20 foot great white shark that dragged down their small boat. Another wave came over, swamped the motor. By that time, I, all I remember is the boat turning to the right, the rolling boat, over. The boat. Uh, I'm in the water next to the cooler and I'm just doing my best. But I'm still, I'm inside. still, He's me, still fighting meanwhile, the, the fish is taking me under now. The three were nothing but a speck in the trackless ocean. Incredibly, miraculously, the crew of the Oceanic spotted them. So did some passengers with video cameras. They've been waving something, and so we're making a direct turn toward them. I don't know where the big red boat comes up. And he seemed like he was going to go away, and I don't know where he makes his turn, hits the horn. When he blew the horn, all the crew, we all were crying because we knew we were safe. A lifeboat rescued the three. They were winched aboard. And boy, do they have a fish story to tell. The longest fishing battle ever in history we broke this weekend. 14 and a half foot battle on a great white shark. And even after the boat capsized, I was still battling the shark. I cut it with my teeth and I released them. Rene was quite remarkable. And, and he was influenced as a child. Yeah. You learned all of this. Yeah, it's really interesting because, you know, we have all, uh, on the other side of the spectrum, you have, you know, this guy, J.D. Hammer, who happened to be, you know, his teacher. And <laughs> J.D.'s entire philosophy is the completely opposite of Renee. So you have, you know, J.D. teaching Renee, Renee kind of butting off and doing his own thing. You know, the student surpasses the teacher, but it's just it, it, he gets carried away with it, whereas J.D. just found this grounding and, you know, and just helping kids and being out in nature. Uh, Renee was trying to prove something, you know, to himself and to everyone that, you know, ended up in his own demise pretty much. Yeah. So it's just, you know, there's just like these little philosophical ideas about how you approach life that are bigger than shark fishing or, you know, that are kind of coming through with these characters. And, you know, Renee represents that obsession. I like JD and what he was doing with all of the boys. I mean, he had a surrogate family there and major influence on so many lives yeah absolutely and and he's just such a genuine and nice guy and he still mm -hmm. does he still does have a, a big influence on these guys and uh, and you know uh he's still out there um probably five days a week out in the keys on the bridges you know t taking all kinds of people out there that you know for many years have still been fishing with him some of them are men who are 60 years old now because jd's like in his 70s mm -hmm. so it's it's pretty amazing. It's pretty it's pretty beautiful to see, man. It really is. Now, for those who aren't familiar with shark fishing, how hard is it? I, I don't think it's something you could just pick up without a heck of a lot of practice and working out somehow. I mean, there's a science to it, but seriously, physical endurance and technique and patience, all of these attributes people are learning. Yeah, totally. Um there's a lot you have to you have to be familiar with the environment that you're working in as well. So you have to know something about the ocean, about the currents, about the tides, about how fish feed. Um, you have to know stuff about the gear. And then in addition to that, um, yeah, you would have to be a, you have to be a little crazy. too. <laughs> you have to be a little bit nuts because it's not something that like that every kind of sportsman or sports fisherman is trying to to accomplish a lot of people think that you know sharks are a nuisance when they're fishing because they kind of just eat all the fish or, or that are right. coming up around the boat and things like that and you know whereas you know these these guys you know seek them out as as a game fish as something that is you know uh so, something that you know that is worthy is a worthy adversary to proving you know to proving yourself and to, to targeting these species i don't know it's it's pretty intense when when you're around these guys and they hook up to this fish it's really exciting you could feel the adrenaline with, oh, yeah. without even holding the reel sure. you know i've held i've, I've i haven't caught a, a ton of sharks from land-based positions i've caught more on boats but there's something really there's something that happens in your brain when you when you're holding on to that reel that rod and reel and it's just screaming out and you're actually attached to it with a harness on the beach and yeah, it's just, it's something, it, it's the adrenaline, I guess, you know, it's just something goes off in, in, in your head. And I guess some people got so addicted to that or that, you know, they just, they just sought it out and, and followed that impulse, you know, especially Renee. Yeah. Well, you've got this massive beast that you finally yank out of the ocean. 
is it going to eat you? I mean, I was raised around the Great Lakes. Sharks aren't there. If if there there yeah. are, then there'd be a serious problem. <laughs> so, <laughs> So there's a definite element of fear here. Um, sharks are big. I mean, I don't know how big they get. It depends on the type of shark, but they're dangerous. Yeah, I mean, they can be. Uh, it's you know, if you're if you're if you're shark fishing, I mean, you know, you could say that you know you're quite. Well, you could be asking for something. I wouldn't have a problem with saying that. Um, <laughs> most of the time, sharks don't really. You know, I, I was at my friend's house on a condo in Miami Beach a couple of days ago and saw big old hammerhead shark cruising the beach and everyone was swimming and they just most of the time they really don't want to do anything to anyone most of the time it's like an accidental bite it, mm -hmm. that's there is some fact to that as well and uh or it's people spear fishing and they're in the water and there's blood in the water and things like that um you know th th so they can be dangerous i mean mm -hmm. especially if you're putting yourself in in their environment so you, it's something that you accept if you're uh if you're doing that, if you are in their environment, I guess. Sure. Well, certainly after the movie Jaws, I think everybody envisions sharks being mammoth. Yeah. Mammoth, human-eating creatures that you have to watch out for. Great whites. Yeah. Um, it's it's interesting, you know. I mean, sharks got a bad rap after Jaws for sure, and uh, now some of that sentiment's changing because of like you know the 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 marine biology community and the things that people are. We're showing and obviously we all know how important sharks are to our environment now so i mean i myself am not for you know killing any sharks or, or anything like that and i'm and for any kind of i'm all for any kind of regulation and and, and conservative efforts for them but mm -hmm. um yes yeah, sharks the, back in that era you know that we're portraying in this you're going to see you know this time period where the sharks were considered you know monsters and so sure. At some point, you know, in this, in probably in like the seven, in throughout the seventies, you know, when even before Jaws came out, like these guys thought that they were like, you know, doing it like the beach a favor or something. They thought right. that, you know, it's it's it it, it had a different context uh, to it than what it does now. Uh, back then, and you're gonna see like how the sport has changed. Cause back then, they were pretty much killing all, a whole bunch of sharks. Whereas nowadays, right. uh, nowadays, I think that we just know a lot more and. You know, it's it's just things have changed and the willingness from the fishing community to change is like really important. And uh, it, it's it's cool that these guys still get to practice their sport while uh, also being on the side of the sharks nowadays rather than just killing them. Your documentary really tells uh, quite the story and gives everyone a feel of what South Beach really was about and what was going on with shark fishing and the mentorship of boys and how youth really found themselves a family and a sense of purpose. It, it's quite the story. Where can people find your documentary? Well, right now we're currently seeking a distribution deal. Uh, we just came off of Doc NYC, which is the biggest documentary festival in the country, mm -hmm. where we are streaming the film for about a week and we had our New York City premiere. So that was great. Um, and right now you can go online at southbeachsharkclub.com. And you can watch a number of different videos and see these really cool old photos from back in the 70s on Miami Beach. And uh, there's a bunch of content that, you know, I'm really happy to to bring to the public eye because it just hasn't been seen before that bygone era in uh, Miami Beach. So right now you can support the film by buying by buying merchandise or, you know, listening to this podcast and just following us, uh, joining our newsletter, adding us on any social media. Everything is South Beach Shark Club on Instagram and uh, Facebook and everywhere else. So uh, you just follow us along on this journey while we uh, seek distribution. And, you know, eventually it should be on a stream platform in the coming months. You tell a compelling story, and I think you're honoring a bygone era that I think people need to think about, the value of a community. And huh, maybe people even do some thinking about what commercialization takes away. Sure. That's really mm -hmm. great. I'm glad that you, got, that you took that away from this. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we need more of that. I mean, that unfortunately, <laughs> a lot of that's happened to Florida. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, This just represents a small community of that. And I'm sure there's so many other little stories like this all over the place. So, you know, it's really an honor and, and it, uh, amazing for, for us to have the opportunity to put this together and, and for people to see it and engage in it and maybe identify with it, whether you're, you know, someone who's a South Floridian or someone who just you know, wants to hear a, a 
compelling human story. And, you know, I'm sure there's, there's something that everyone can identify within it, even though, uh, so <laughs> some people may not be interested in fishing. It's really like, we like to say, it's not really a movie about shark fishing. It's a movie about people. Yes, it is. Absolutely. And you, you won an award, didn't you? Yes, we did. We won uh, the Documentary Achievement Award at Miami Film Festival, Excellent. where we premiered. Yeah, it was really cool. Also, it was like, just like, kind of like a big party and a big homecoming of just so many different walks of life and people from the old Miami Beach and, you know, their children and other people who just like, drove, drove over here just to watch the movie hours and we, we sold out two, yeah, two theaters and it was just like a big party really. And like really just overwhelming and, and a crazy, crazy way to show the movie for the first time. It was like, you know, Miami beach, the spirit of it was alive again in the room. Yes, so that was, was very cool. Say, that's neat. Yeah. Bringing yeah. back an era that would have meant a lot to a lot of people. That's terrific. What is your website again? The website is uh, www.southbeachsharkclub.com. Excellent. Well, thank you, Robert, for being on the show. And I'm hoping everyone checks out your documentary and buys some merchandise so that it can be more widely distributed. That would be great. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you for the great questions. And thank you for watching. And mm -hmm. I'm glad that you enjoyed it and uh, took something away from it. Yes, I did. Thank you for being on the show. You've been listening to the Truckers Network Radio Show on TNC Radio Live. I'm your host, Shelley Johnson. I've been speaking with Robert Ramos, the director of South Beach Shark Club. Definitely check out their website at southbeachsharkclub.com. Great documentary. Stay tuned for more great programming on tncradio.live. Thank you for listening to another great interview on tncradio.live and the Truckers Network Radio Show. All of the material you hear on tncradio.live on our website, our broadcasts, or our podcasts are copyrighted. There can be no distribution without the express consent of tncradio.live and its partners. For inquiries, write us at info at tncradio.live. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast of the Truckers Network Radio Show.